Thanks for tuning in to the Beyond Normal podcast, where we highlight minority business owners and founders, and we use this platform to shed light on their entrepreneur journey. Welcome, everybody, to the Beyond Normal podcast. Very special guest today. I want to introduce you guys to Maria Worley, the founder of Start.Law, which is a subscription-based legal service for startups. Thanks for uh, hopping on the episode for us, Maria. Oh, thank you, Kenny. I'm glad to be here. All right. I want to kick things right off, give you the opportunity to tell folks just a little bit about your background, you know, your experience, your career so far. Sure. I started my career as a criminal defense attorney in New York City, and I enjoyed it, but it it was not a career that was really conducive to having a family at all. Um, And so, you know, literally pregnant, walking out of a jail one day, I decided, all right, we got to we got to do something else. Um, My husband and I moved to California and there were all these people out there doing amazing things with startups. I mean, it it was, I really saw the opportunity for change in all of these businesses. And so, you know, raised the kids for a few years and started thinking about how I could get involved in this legal world and uh, how I can be a part of the startup community. And so uh, I, you know, I, I started reaching out to a few people, talking to a few people more, and I kept seeing that founders were having problems getting access to legal representation. Um, it was either really expensive law firms, you know, that just nobody could afford, or, you know, these DIY websites that were popping up that. I mean, it's great they're providing legal forms, but they're not giving you any legal advice. Um, and I have a real problem with them. I almost think that they're you know, doing a disservice because you're getting kind of a second class legal solution. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how can I fix this? And uh, here's start.law. So it's a monthly subscription, same way any gym would be or something like that. And you get an attorney that's there to help you, you know, in same way as if you were paying a big fee to a, a big law firm. I appreciate you uh, giving that background. And uh, like you said, you, you notice some things around the startup community, individuals starting their own business where, you know, that legal space, that is something um, for a lot of folks, it's just like a black box, right? It's something that yeah. they know something goes into it and something comes out, but they're not necessarily sure about um how to navigate it and then defining some of those um why you actually need to have some of those some of those legal documents and just things put in order so that if if things pop up that business owner has you know just things in place it's somewhat of a security right to to navigate some of the risk absolutely and it's so much more affordable if you do that stuff proactively rather than winding up in a lawsuit that you're defending yourself against and you know then that's when the real big bills come in and uh, you know it's a bad situation mm-hmm. especially um, so, you know it's, go ahead. sorry it can, it can even be worse than that though too is just you know especially with startups and when you're talking about you know, ideas and protecting an idea, you know, if you don't have the right documents there, that idea isn't yours, you know, you gotta, you gotta protect it with the legal documents. Otherwise, it can very easily be stolen. Um, even something as small as, you know, if you're, if you're working a day job and trying to build a business at the same time, I've actually seen cases where employers have, you know, taken the idea because they say, you know, it's on company time and it's really hard to prove that you didn't um, without having those legal documents in place. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You think about uh, side hustles and people just like you said, they're doing stuff at the same time running in parallel a lot of times when they have a day job, right? So there's that gray area. Um, so that's a, that's a great example there. 
Um, I guess, could you tell me about the uh, that subscription model um, and how uh, startup founders would be able to leverage that service? Absolutely. Um, so we've got three levels. The first is when you're just starting out um, the launch, and that's $99 a month. And it covers everything you would need to launch. You know, it's initial contracts um, for people you're working with. It gives you incorporation. And maybe most importantly, it just gives you access to an attorney who knows your business and knows you. And if you have a question that comes up, shoot an email, give a quick call. The next is uh, the growth subscription. If you're seeking funding, if you're, um, you know, just getting more established, hiring more people on, you need to start protecting your trademarks, you know, that's, that's where that plan comes in. Um, and then the third plan is exit. You know, if you are ready to sell your company, if you even are going to try to go public, um, we, you know, we have a plan for that as well. And you can uh, sign up on start.law. Appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I think that's a that's an ex- excellent uh, model. Like you yes. said, they can just leverage it somewhat like a subscription service. You think Netflix, you think of some of the other services that we have in our day, daily life. Um, exactly. Just being able to plug it in where needed, right? And then mm-hmm. um, kind of leverage it more when you need it. And then in other instances, maybe, t- you know, uh, kind of turn the dial down a little bit and focus on other parts of the business. I, I love that model. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, what's something um, you mentioned kind of having that that aha moment um, working in the legal uh, industry and then saying you wanted to start this uh, really this startup uh, for startups, right, with the the legal subscription model? You know, what's something that you've learned throughout the process of starting this business? You like pretty much uh, earn your lumps, right? You take your lumps (laughs) through the process. Um, Tell us a little bit about um, some of that learning process and maybe one thing in particular that um, you learned setting up your business, running it, that you would have liked to know, you know, at the start of, of this process of starting your own business. Sure. So marketing, <laughs> um, I guess they say everybody has got a second job as a marketer now these days because it's not just enough to have a great idea. You've got to let people know you have it. Um, and you know, I've never done anything with marketing before. And so educating myself on that was a ton of work. <laughs> um, and trying to do that while also, you know, handle the legal clients that I had, it was, it was a lot of hours. Um, and what I, the solution for that, that I found, and I didn't even know it existed, there are marketing mentors out there. So if you can't afford, you know, to bring someone on staff or, something like that, you can work with a mentor. It's, you know, a monthly fee or a flat fee. And it's a person that, you know, just guides you and says, you know, hey, I think you should be posting content in this area because that's where people who need your service are. And it's someone that, you know, my marketing mentor looked at my website and was like, you know, this really doesn't look great. And so (laughs) I am in the process still of finishing that up and publishing a new one. But, you know, it's just a person who knows marketing really well and can lead you down the right path, you know, within a limited budget. Mm hmm. I appreciate you giving that perspective. And like you said, you're wearing those different hats as the, as the, uh, the founder, you're the owner, you're the one who's got to make a lot of those decisions. Right. But Mm -hmm. going through it, I think you learn what your strengths are and then what your opportunities are. You, like you said, it's good to have some, some other resources there to help you through that process. You Mm -hmm. mentioned marketing, that's not necessarily going to be everybody's strong suit. So making sure you, if you don't feel like you feel you have the um, capabilities to do it yourself, maybe you do have someone there as a resource, you know, um, have that team around you that can support you Mm -hmm. um, to where it's not like you're, like you said, you don't want to feel like you have to wear all the hats. You will in different instances have to um, be a part of the process in each of those different functions, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it alone. That's right. Because if you do it alone, you're, you know, you're educating yourself on a full job. You don't have time for that. You know, (laughs) exactly. Let go of that control a little. Yes. Um, 
So I wanted to transition a little bit. Um, you mean, obviously, your business is geared around the legal space and just providing that service to founders. As we think around some of the conversations right now that are taking place in 2020, you know, the, the pandemic that hit us all at the top of the year was COVID. But, you know, what I'm calling the, really the second pandemic that's, um, you know, impacting us all in 2020 is, you know, just the conversations around uh, racial inequalities. Mm -hmm. And I think when me and you initially kind of touched base, you know, you brought up some uh, interesting points. I, I think it would be good for you to share with the with the um, the listeners around from a legal perspective, some of the conversations and um, some of the dialogue you've seen happen around implicit bias um, conversations sure. um, and kind of some of the, the implications of those conversations, you know, as we're all having these conversations now around some of the inequalities that are going on, not just within race, but you think about gender and then uh, sexual orientation as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, so much of this is subliminal and um, I'm glad that the problem is finally being brought to light, um, just how deep it is. You know, I think most people were aware, you know, of police brutality and things like that. But now that the conversation is going deeper, I, I just think it's bringing more of a drive for people to change it. And a real great example of just how subliminal racism is affecting people. There was a medical algorithm that is making white patients receive treatment priority over sicker black patients. And it wasn't intentionally racist. It, the algorithm excluded race, but the way the algorithm determined which patient got treatment was based on how much money uh, was being spent on the patient. But black patients, have less money spent on them. You know, how that came about is, you know, maybe originally outright racism, but now there are all these longstanding cultural and social biases that are just, you know, there. And the data is pulled. And all of a sudden you have this situation where, you know, white people are, you know, this algorithm is here to determine who should be healed and, you know, no, we're going to treat the white people better than the black people because the data is just implicitly biased. So it's just terrible. <laughs> um, no. And, I, yeah, you no. know, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, um, that example um, because I, I, I think, uh, you know, the conversations being had right now, that's one thing to remember, like you said, kind of some of the things that are just implicit, right? It, they're just natural, naturally in some of these models that we're seeing right now. And then when it comes to data, you know, some of the things that people say, right, is, you know, um, garbage in, garbage out, right? So exactly. if you have some of these, if you have some of these um, precon like preconceived notions, right, that go into, you know, the data before you actually start building some of these more advanced um, models, you know, they're essentially going to mirror, you know, what people may have been doing, say, 25, 30 years ago. And, you know, some, some of the terms now, I think we're all kind of familiar with kind of the mortgage industry, for example, right? You mm -hmm. think about redlining, you think about actual maps mm -hmm. where specific sections of the city of different cities, right? We're essentially just told, no, you, you will not be lending to that, to that group. It's the same kind of implicit kind of, um, you know, assumptions that are made around um, based off of the color of people's skin, they're going to get certain treatment. And that mm -hmm. treatment is, you know, the nurse, like the medical example, example that you just gave us, that nurse in that situation, she's not actively doing something to convey this um, this bias or this racism to the uh, patients, but the system itself will probably find ways to recommend certain solutions or diagnose those customers, like you said, a, a different way. And that's mm -hmm. where we see some of the longer term impacts um, of, of these decisions that were, were made, you know, mm -hmm. decades ago. That's right. And did you know that, um, I just learned this recently, 
Black women are almost four times more likely to die from post-childbirth related, uh, I don't want to say illnesses, but, you know, emergencies than white women. Complications, yeah. exactly. Complications, exactly. thank you. Yeah, exactly. And that's regardless of income, regardless of education level, you know, I mean, almost four times. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. It's happening in America today. I mean, come on. We got to mm -hmm. do better. <laughs> yes, we do. And I think, uh, you know, along those lines, I know uh, in our previous conversation that we had, you, you had some, uh, uh, maybe some, uh, some interesting uh, ways for uh, minorities to maybe combat some of that implicit bias that we see in some of the bigger systems like nationwide when it comes to things like funding and things like that. I think there was a call out or two that you had maybe using different different banks or just, you know, different, right. what, are, what are the different options that, uh, you know, minority founders in particular can use to maybe combat some of these systems that have that implicit bias? Yeah, I'm, I tell my clients generally try to work with people like you. So if you are looking for a loan, you know, go to, go to a bank in your neighborhood, um, you know, go to someone who's having the same experience as you are, because I, I think it's just human nature to connect more, to trust more with people that you relate to. And, you know, big male white banker is not going to relate to a minority applicant for a loan. Um, same thing with investors. If, you know, if you're looking for an, you know, an investor in your company, you know, seek people out that share your experiences. Um, and there's some good resources finally addressing some of this stuff. Like one of them um, is Founder Gym. Um, they're out of California, but, you know, obviously everything's virtual these days. They, you know, they're, they're specifically there for the startup community to connect with resources that are for minorities investor groups that, you know, are looking to invest in black businesses, women businesses, those, those things are there. So it's just finding them and, and utilizing them because I think sadly you're going to get better results still. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, that candid honesty, like you said, people that have gone through experiences like you, they can look at the, the data that some of these systems um, actually spits out, right? Um, mm -hmm. there, there's no fault there. We need systems in place. We need structure. Um, but on the flip side of that, there is, you know, there is, uh, you know, the businesses that are successful, they find ways to relate. Um, you know, they, they can at least convey some of that high, high uh, EQ, right? Yes. High emotional intelligence and you, you have a balanced approach. And I think that's what we need now. Um, more than ever, because we got all the tools from a data perspective to make um, really slick uh, systems and, mm -hmm. you know, make data talk across different different platforms. And you think about all the data that they're collecting on me and you right now, they have yeah. a lot of data. So <laughs> the data so tells them a lot and they can dig into that part. But there still has to be a human component there that connects kind of some of that, that emotional intelligence into the system as well. And that's going to take you know, people like you, you know, creating services like you do to make sure we still have that element in place for some of these businesses and we don't overstep that line. We don't go over that boundary where we're infringing on people's rights. Thank you. Yeah. And I, more, you know, as time goes on and technology improves, you know, it's just more important that, you know, like you said, we got to get good data going in and we got to have people realizing why the data on minorities is not you know, we can't rely on it. So we find workarounds to do it. Exactly. And uh, you touched on, uh, briefly, you touched on the, uh, the stat earlier, um, just around the um, complications from pregnancy for African American women, for example, mm -hmm. right? And that, yeah. and that number is higher than the average, right? That's higher than other um, ethnicities. You know, that, uh, that topic around, uh, you know, uh, pregnancy, giving birth to kids. I know you have some uh, some feedback on that that you wanted to share for the audience as well around just your thoughts and, and some of the bias you see in the workplace when it comes to uh, women bearing children and maybe having some of that support um, in the workplace. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 
I think the pandemic has actually really brought this to light. Um, you know, I keep seeing these articles like when mom zooms last and, you know, I think something came out the other day that women do the jobs in the service industry. Generally it's like, you know, 80% of service jobs are filled by women. And those are the ones that, you know, are really being impacted by the pandemic because, you know, the, the contact. Um, and so, you know, before the pandemic, I think women were at like 81 cents to the male dollar. And, you know, what is it going to be after this? And I, th I just think, you know, we've come a long way as far as women's rights. But I heard a comedian once say, um, my grandmother couldn't vote. My mother couldn't get the pill. And I have no time. And I think that it's really important that we value women's time so that they are able to be able to progress in their careers um, for, for the individual woman, but also for the entire society, right? I mean, all those, all those countries with women leaders are doing well with the pandemic. So <laughs> it benefits us all. Exactly. Like you said, that, that pay, that pay parity, you know, opportunity parity, right? We want to see that you know, no matter your gender, your sexual orientation, your race, right. you know, uh, you have uh, kind of equal footing is what I like to call it, right? I'm not saying that, yeah. you know, we got to put people in roles just because, right? But in terms mm -hmm. of that access to that opportunity, we got to figure out how to make that an even playing field. Absolutely. Um, and we have to realize that because of the history you know, it's not an even playing field, you know, it's, it's not fixed. You know, just thinking about all the conversations that are happening right now, you know, I think the one that is top of mind right, right now is kind of the, the conversations around, you know, uh, uh, racial and, you know, just overall social uh, inequality and how we have that parity. What are some of the, the learnings that you think can be applied from the battles that you are having um, and what you're fighting for to that, that conversation that we're all kind of embedded in right now um, when it comes to racial uh, inequality and having that parity? Sure. I think um, hiring can be a big deal. So, you know, a lot of times people hire through their network. Um, and as business owners, I think we have a responsibility and also get a huge benefit from um, going outside of our network to hire. So, you know, if employers would be posting things, you know, in there, there are now like specifically, um, you know, things like LinkedIn for based just on minorities and you can post a job there, you know, and it's, it's mm -hmm. minorities graduating from college and things like that. You know, even with internships, go outside of your network. Don't give it to your kid's friend, give it to, you know, post it, go outside of your comfort zone. Um, because, you know, when women started, you know, I mean, it was world war two, right. And, you know, Oh my goodness, these women can do the jobs while the men are off fighting the war, you know, and mm -hmm. guess what? The minorities can do the jobs too. It's, you know, this is not a, mm -hmm. this is not a bad problem. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I, also, go ahead. I was just going to say along those lines, uh, like you said, you, you got to give kind of access. You got, you do have to go outside of your network to have that diversity. And I think, Mm -hmm. Where the businesses are right now, for example, I'll get I'll use your uh, business as an example, right? Um, you have right your cu your customer base could be essentially global, right? You could mm -hmm. you know service um, startups. You know you're not necessarily tied to one location, one state, one city, That's and right. so a lot of times what 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 happens for a business that has that much opportunity in your um, your customer base is pretty much exponential. You need to have people on your team that somewhat represent some of these markets as well. So yes. you do need to have somebody right from a different cultural background than you, because you know, Hey, there's going to be business owners that want somebody like to your point before around when it comes to banking and go to, I want to go to somebody who's within my community who understands my story. Yes. And so you got to really have that balanced workforce to service that balanced customer base because 
you know, pretty much every business I can think of right now has somewhat of a, a global presence, right? It's just a mm-hmm. click of a button on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, it's right at your fingertips. And so you, you got to have that, uh, that balance um, employee base, that, that balance partnership base in That's order right. for people to feel like you have that accepting, you have a product that, you know, you, a product that essentially understands them. That's right. And, you know, we're not talking about token people here, like bring Mm -hmm. people into your organization that, you know, be comfortable with change, like listen, you know, Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, (laughs) And so you, you've given us a lot to think about here today. I appreciate you coming on for an episode um, and sharing, uh, you know, sharing your story um, and then just some of the opportunities that you're seeing, you know, in terms of what's next for starting out law, you know, uh, tell the listeners a little bit about uh, what you have coming up and, uh, you know, anything that you may be looking forward to, you know, 2021 and beyond. Absolutely. Um, our biggest news is um, as of November 1st in our two higher uh, subscription levels. Um, we're going to be including taxes because everyone keeps saying, uh, taxes, how do I, how do I make business decisions that are going to minimize my tax bill? Um, and so we um, have a attorney coming on who's formerly a CPA and she's going to address that need for our clients. So I'm excited about that. Um, like yeah. Thanks. And- and so how can, uh, you know, founders and just listeners in general, how can they, uh, you know, reach out, you know, see what's upcoming with uh, Start.Law, you know, and just reach out maybe if they potentially want to use your service, like what, how do they go about doing that? Sure. Um, I would say just go to Start.Law because it's easy to remember and everything is there. Um, you can email me or reach out to me on LinkedIn um, and we'll go from there. Um, you know, hope, hope that we can bring better businesses to this world and improve it for all of us. Appreciate that, Maria. And uh, for the listeners, uh, thanks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll, we'll have this on, uh, you know, all uh, major streaming platforms as well. And uh, thanks again to Maria. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Kenny. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Beyond Normal podcast. We can be streamed across all major streaming platforms in addition to YouTube. Come back again.